Hi, good afternoon. This is Barbara Reynolds at the Corporation for National Service. I want to welcome you to today's presentation on National Service Criminal History Checks Advanced Topics. We are just now opening up the webinar portion, uh, the visual portion of our presentation. There's uh, just a couple seconds left if you want to go ahead and answer the poll question, what is your role in your organization for ensuring compliance with the criminal history check requirements, please, please answer that poll in the next couple seconds. Also, if you want to put yourself on the map of the world, please do that as well. We'll get started with our visual presentation in just a couple seconds. So we're counting down. I see some people are answering the poll. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much. All right. We are going to go ahead and start with the visuals. So as I said, um, my name again is Barbara Reynolds, and I will be kicking us off with the logistics portion of today's presentation and providing some opening comments, some framing comments for what today's presentation is meant to accomplish and how this webinar fits in with our overall training program for AmeriCorps State and National. So before we get into any of the content, I do want to conduct a quick technology check with you just to make sure that Adobe Connect is in our, our phone lines are being our friend today. Um, so you can um, you can see that we will be recording. We are recording today's presentation, so if you don't want to be recorded, definitely disconnect at this time. We will post the visuals for today's presentation along with our audio portion on the Knowledge Network later this month. And we will have a chat box open throughout today's presentation. So if you, um, if you could, just take a second right now and type a quick greeting into the chat box to uh, your colleagues, your folks you saw on the map of the world, um, folks on the line with us today, just a quick howdy, how's it going? I um, want to get a sense of uh, who is on the, the line with us and also make sure that you can hear me. This is always the, the nervous part of the webinar when it's eerily silent. Great, thank you so much. I see a lot of greetings going into that chat box. That's wonderful. Thank you. Keep it coming. If you haven't typed in your howdy yet, please do. We definitely want to say hi to you in the chat box and want to know that you're on with us today. So as I said, we will have this chat box open. Uh, our presenters and uh, I will be looking at it as we move through our presentation with you. Um, in addition to your howdies, if there are comments or questions you have while, um, while we are presenting content, please feel free to put them in the chat box. They, they won't get lost. Um, and we definitely have you use that tool as we are moving through our content today. So just to kick off the, the uh, opening remarks for today's presentation, I just wanted to let you know that today's session is part of the 2018 AmeriCorps program staff series that our state and national staff are putting together and presenting for you. Um, each month we have one or two webinars that are designed and delivered for um, AmeriCorps programs, AmeriCorps national and multi-state programs, our tribal programs, and our state commission partners. Some, sometimes the webinars are uh, tailored to a particular audience, uh, just the tribes or just the nationals or just the commissions. Sometimes they're, they're meant for um, anyone and everyone, and they're focused on a particular topic like today's presentation. We definitely hope that this series, including today's presentation, will offer you and, and really all of our partners around the country an opportunity to take a step back from the day-to-day -day hustle and bustle of the work that we do and focus on some of the bigger picture issues of our work together, some of the more complex or complicated aspects of what we do. So with that in mind, I think the, the criminal history check requirements obviously fits into that category. You can see on the slide in front of you, this is the, the list of the webinars that we are uh, presenting and covering during 2018. We're about halfway through, a little over halfway through our series. And um, we have, uh, we've, as I said, we've covered, I think, some of the bigger picture items like continuity planning, sustainability planning, some of the more technical pieces like um, developing data collection plans. And now, of course, today we're looking at criminal history checks um, and advanced topics related to it. So typically, um, as I said, for, for these webinars, we are uh, expecting, and I think, I think uh, your howdies are validating for me that we're having a combined audience of uh, staff from AmeriCorps programs as well as staff from state service commissions. We do hope, we, we think it makes sense, and, and the content today is really targeted 
for those of you who have a particular responsibility or role related to the criminal history checks, right, like the, the questions in our poll at the beginning of the session indicated, we, we think and we hope that the content today is going to be really relevant to you. If you conduct, it's your responsibility to conduct compliant checks at your program, if you monitor for compliance, um, for your subgrantees if you're at the commission, for your sites or your staff if you're at a, a national or multi-state program, um, and, and or if you, are, um, you have a responsibility to provide training on the criminal history checks. We know that that is also um, a major responsibility and something that a lot of folks are doing along with us and our staff around the country. Um, so that's what we are looking for in terms of today's participation. Um, it is my pleasure to turn it over to our speaker today. Um, Liz Jung, as you can see, is, uh, is our esteemed colleague, our, our specialist, I think, our expert in criminal history checks. Um, she's been with us for now five years, right? It's a, it's a big anniversary um, and comes from a great background, of course, with AmeriCorps VISTA. So um, take it away, Liz. And as I said, while Liz is presenting, please feel free to use the chat box to uh, put in any comments or questions that you have. Thank you. Hey guys, good to be back. Good to see a lot of familiar names in the chat box. Um, we're gonna get started on some criminal history check topics. We, this is not a 101, so if you are coming to learn about how to do the checks or where you can go get the checks, I'm just gonna refer you to our Knowledge Network page. All that information is up there. We're not gonna go over what are the requirements, what's an eligibility mean. We're gonna talk mostly about the enforcement guide actually today. We're going to talk about some other non-compliance issues, but we're really going to do a dive into the mitigation matrix. And then, of course, there's going to be some time for q and I'm going to look at the ch uh, chat box every now and then, um, and we'll have Barbara will be monitoring it, some other people will be monitoring it. So we'll try to get your questions. Otherwise, you can just leave them at the end. So let's go ahead and get started. So I hope that you guys are going to walk away from this presentation understanding what kind of resources are available to you, and then also just an opportunity to ask any questions that you may have that you haven't had answered before. So I am not a state and national program officer. I don't work with AmeriCorps. I actually work under the Office of the Chief Risk Officer. This is just a brief, very simple org chart up on the chart you see. And I basically just show this to you guys to just emphasize that while I'm not a program officer, we do work very closely with program officers. So if you have a very specific program question, um, I may not be able to answer it, but we'll have people here in the room who can help you. If you have criminal history check questions, we can definitely go at it. So if you've been to any of my uh, the convenings, the regional convenings, these screens will look a, little, look a little familiar to you, but I always want to talk about it because I think a lot of times with criminal history checks, we get, we get really caught in the weeds. It's really easy to get caught up in what you're, if you're going to the right repository, what documentation you have, and you forget about why we're doing this. And I just want to reinforce how important it is to develop a culture where abuse is discussed, addressed, and prevented. What you see on the screen is just an example that I pulled from a CDC document. You can find it there at the bottom. But, and this is just an example. This isn't a requirement, but this is just somewhere to get you th started on thinking about how you, how you protect your communities. And so you can see this CDC example has a six-step program. You're going to be screening, it recommends you to screen and select employees and volunteers or guidelines on interactions, how do you monitor people, how do you ensure a safe environment, training. This is a big, this is a lot of stuff to do to create a safe environment. And CNCS actually only requires you to do that first half of that first bullet, which is screening. So I hope you guys have had these conversations and are thinking about how you can incorporate other things into your practices to make sure that everyone is safe. And I know it can be really difficult because you guys are all, I, everyone, we, everyone is wearing multiple hats and I know no one, not a lot of people are experts on abuse, on abuse trainings, on what type, on how to look out for your communities. but. It's something that you have to talk to and you have to talk about and you have to address. And there are some challenges that people face a lot of times. And I just want to talk about those and address those and hopefully give you some ideas to, to overcome those challenges. But there are, these, there are these beliefs that abuse doesn't happen at your organization, that the offenders can never be your staff or never your volunteers or never your community members. And then there's this implicit, uh, like, you're implicitly saying that abuse happens here if you focus on it. And I think you just have to get over those, 
those beliefs. You, you can't operate in the sense that everything is perfect. We know that abusers are everywhere. They're not walking around telling you that they're about to abuse someone. So you just have to be vigilant, a little bit paranoid, but also realistic. Then a lot of times there can be structural issues that hinder prevention. So this idea of poor employee or volunteer retention, the fact that people come in and out of your doors a lot, it can be exhausting to continuously do training every year or every couple months about this. But I think it's just so important to to do that. You have to, one, acknowledge it, and then also get support to continue to do it, because if this becomes something that's always talked about in your organization, then it becomes part of your culture, and then people know what to do in, you know, God forbid, instances where they see something or they need to report something. There are always challenges with limited or inadequate resources, who has the time, who has the money, who has the expertise. And then there's also this idea that it can be really difficult to adopt abuse prevention policies and prevent procedures. This is actually where CNCF can help you because we require you to do CHC. Um, we give you money to do CHC. We require you to have policies and procedures in place. Since And since you're already doing this, I just suggest you to, again, make that conversation broader. Go beyond just screening. Figure out how you can best monitor your people, what kind of training you're going to have, what type of policies and procedures you have to ensure safety in your environment. So I just hope you guys are thinking about that. I hope. Um, over the summer in the past year or so, people have made some progress on creating safety systems for their people. Yep. What's highlighted in orange now is, again, these two bullets that will help, that CNCS can help you begin that conversation with leadership if you haven't had that already. So again, here are just some resources for you. These are the same resources that I bring pretty much to all the trainings, but it's always good to emphasize what they are. I know it's a lot on this slide, but you'll have access to the slide, so you can go check it out. That first bullet, the Nonprofit Risk Management Center Staff Schooling Toolkit, that is actually a license that CNCS has bought and is available to all grantees. You have a ton of resources up on the NSOPW website. There's a little education tab that's right next to like the tab that you use to go do that check. A ton of stuff, great stuff is on there. And then if you're interested in this six-step program, that I've talked about in the previous two slides, that information can be found on the third indented bullet underneath the CDC bullet, the Preventing Child Sexual Abuse Within Youth Serving Organizations. So just more resources for you, resources for you. And then at the my bottom two are also resources to prevent elder abuse. All right, now let's get back into the weeds. Let's talk about some common compliance findings so the common compliance findings are, are pretty basic. They fall into three major buckets, time, documentation, and understanding. In terms of time, it's just failure to do the NSOPW before start of service, and then failure to initiate the state and FBI checks on time. There's a lot, mo a ton of noncompliance in with, with, is because of time. Then you've got documentation. It's just failure to document adjudication. Sometimes you're going to get results where there are no results, right? You get NSOPW with no hits, FBI with no hits. You still have to adjudicate that. You still have to have written documentation that you've re reviewed it and this person is cleared to serve. There's failure to document initiation of state and FBI checks. You guys have the flexibility of defining initiation as long as it's one step beyond getting consent and it's towards getting a criminal history check. That should be documented in your policies and procedures. Um, and you should be following that then. And then also just failure to retain results of state and FBI checks. I was looking at a lot of IPR results this week, and it's, it's amazing just a lot, all the responses that we get of people saying, we did this, but all the results have been, like, have been destroyed. <laughs> you have to keep the results. Um, and then also understanding. Sometimes people don't understand that they have to do checks for their own staff. They do all the members, forget their staff. Um, sometimes they hire all well, very well-intentioned. They hire a vendor to take on this burden for them, and it turns out the vendor does not have access to the right repositories, um, and then they are non-compliant. And then accompaniment. Accompaniment is a beast. There is so much documentation requirement requirements, and if you miss one piece of documentation with accompaniment, you are now non-compliant. So people accompaniment can be a huge issue. And also just sometimes grantees don't update their own policies and procedures to be in line with CNCS regulations. So these are, it sounds like everything. <laughs> and unfortunately, that's kind of the case with CHV. It can be really complicated. I know we're trying to make it easier for you guys, but 
there's a lot of noncompliance with CHC. All right, let's talk really quickly about CHC verification. I know this is new for you. If you have questions on it, um, I will have Jim Stone here in the room so he can help answer. I may not be able to answer it, but you guys know this drill now. Basically, you have to complete social security number, criminal history check, and citizen verification in the enrollment form. You have to certify NSOPW is complete, and you certify your state and FBI checks are initiated. And then you press save to go on. So hopefully with this new verification and enrollment page now, state and national is going to be totally compliant with criminal <laughs> history checks. Because <laughs> you guys have done everything, which is great. Um, so hopefully that will be the case. All right, now let's go into the enforcement guide. So what does the enforcement guide detail? This is the third iteration of the enforcement guide. It came into being, I guess, in April 2007. Before that, there were two other iterations. They were under different names, too. I believe it was like disallowance guidance. So this one is now the enforcement guide. And it covers a couple of things. It mostly covers uh, documentation requirements and what happens during disallowance. You only go to this guide if something is non-compliant. If all your checks are 100% compliant, you will never have to use this guide ever. So there are a couple things that are covered in this guide. One is ineligibility. It covers all the reporting and documentation requirements, and it has directions about removing this person from service and disallowing all costs. And remember, ineligibility is someone who falls into those four buckets of, ineligible, in, of being ineligible to serve. So that's someone who refuses to consent to doing the checks, someone who makes a false statement in connection with their criminal history checks. So again, that's someone who gives you the wrong fingerprint, someone who falsely, who provides false identify, identification information. And then people who have been convicted of murder, as defined in US 18 U.S. Code 11. You should check that. I don't think I have that one memorized. <laughs> <laughs> and um, people who are required to or on a sex offender, required to register or on a sex offender registry. So those are the people who are ineligible. And then you're also going to have information about your monitoring responsibilities. So for example, the idea of expansion of scope, if you find two or more non-compliant files that you need to expand the scope. Calculating disallowance, there's information about the mitigation matrix. There's information about self-reporting, the documentation requirements for self-reporting, and then also that self-reporting rate. And then it ends with some disallowance and payment procedures. So it talks again about what documentation is required, about the debt notification letter to the prime grantee, and the idea that payment cannot come from the federal funding source. All right, we're going to come back to that. Um, so again, so when do we use this enforcement guide? It's basically when you have cases of ineligibility or noncompliance. And that's noncompliance whether that's self-reported or it's a monitoring action. When do you use the mitigation matrix? When the file is noncompliant. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, so use a mitigation matrix when the file is not compliant. And I also just want to point something out that I think sometimes gets forgotten about. But as of January 1st, 2013, all individuals in covered positions are required to at least have a search of the NSOPW. So if you have a file, if you come across a file that does not have the NSOPW or a mitigating sex offender check um, or other mitigating factors, then it will have a low mitigation rating. So it will result in a low mitigation rating, which if you guys remember, mitigation means the effort to reduce the severity of something. So low mitigation rating results is correlated to a higher disallowance amount. Um, and then there's also a corrective action in the enforcement guide. That's Appendix B. Let's talk a little bit about self-reporting. You need to know two different types of definitions when, we, when you think about self-reporting. The first one is the actual definition of self-reporting, and basically it is allowable when it is allowable to self-report before you receive a written notice of a future oversight or monitoring activity. So that could be an IPERIA sampling, it could be an IG or audit, IG audit or investigation, it could be a site visit, it can be a desk review. And you get this written notice from a monitoring official. What is a not monitoring official? It's a broad definition. It could be program and grants officers of CNCS. It could be state commission staff. And it can be other recipient staff members who are responsible for monitoring 
and enforcing compliance and NSCHC requirements. So a prime recipient cannot self-report to CNCS noncompliance they've discovered during their own monitoring. All right, let's keep on going. So this lovely, lovely chart here is the mitigation matrix. You're going to see that at the very top there, there are different disallowance amounts. One is that self-reporting rate, and then one is that standard disallowance. Standard disallowance is going to come into play um, often when it's a monitoring official who's reviewing your file. So it could be a CNCF program officer, it can be commission staff where that amount then comes into play. Chart is then divided up into two different types of uh, disallowances, which is basically if you have recurring access to vulnerable population, and then if you have no or episodic access to vulnerable population. We are working on a flowchart. I know probably a couple of you guys have seen that flowchart. I want to get it out in this month in July. If we get it out in July, it's going to be a huge, be a huge win. <laughs> We're working on getting it tested still, but hopefully it will come out very soon. So these, this is what it looks like. I'm sorry that it looks so little. Is there, can we zoom in at all? Or is there no way to zoom in? Okay. Yeah, folks can go to full screen, I think. Oh, okay. All right, cool. Yeah, that's great. So let's just look at these flow charts real quickly. So this one is if you have no access or episodic access to vulnerable populations. So our first question is, is a sex offender check present? And you can check all that apply, but only one is needed to move on. So that is, you're looking at a file, you know something is non-compliant, because that's why you're looking at the enforcement guide, that's why you're looking at the mitigation matrix. So you're looking at your file, is there an NSOPW on there? Great, check it off. Is there an incomplete NSOPW? An incomplete NSOPW means it's on time, the name is correct, but it's state or tribe or territory is missing. Is there an adjudicated FBI fingerprint check? So it's not enough just to have your initiated FBI check documentation present. It has to be an adjudicated FBI fingerprint check. You can have a national sex offender registry check from a vendor. You can have a statewide sex offender check from a state of service or the same thing from a state of residence. So what you see in that box, that first gray circular box, these are sex offender checks. And so if you have one, then you're going to go to the next box, yes, is, was it adjudicated? You're going to, if it's yes, you're going to go back to the, you're going to go to the next question. But if not, it's going to be low mitigation. So again, remember, if you don't have, in this circumstance, if you don't have a sex offender check, it's almost automatically going to be low mitigation. But if you do, it's going to ask if you have, if the sex offender check is adjudicated and if it was initiated before the start of service worker hours. If so, or if not, that you're going to get the same question. It's then going to ask you, is the initiation document present even if it's late? So you just you need to have proof that's been initiated even if it's late after the start date. If you have any of these, a fingerprint FBI check, a compliant state of service check, compliant state of residence check, or a vendor check that includes a nationwide search of state criminal history check, if you have any of those, it's going to be high mitigation. If you do not have any of those, it's going to be a moderate mitigation. I mean, sorry, I just said that wrong. If you do not have any of those, it's going to be low, moderate mitigation. You're going to get, it's going to be low, moderate, low mitigation. You're going to get to moderate mitigation, mit I'm sorry, guys. You're going to get to moderate mitigation if the sex offender check was adjudicated. If, but it was, still, it was a late adjudicated. Does that make sense? I'm going to pause right here and just go to uh, questions. So, Liz, you want to pause for questions in the chat box? Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Yep. Guys. yep. So, folks, hopefully we uh, we have not <laughs> completely lost you visually. We hope we're back to the the regular screen now. Um, and if you have any questions or comments based on what you've seen or heard so far, please take a second and put those in the chat box. And we will, we'll pause here and just give you a chance to do that and also to read what you're putting in.
Okay, we've got some examples in the next few slides that will help um, kind of highlight the use and how you understand the mitigation matrix. We're going to go on next to, this is the mitigation flowchart when you do have recurring access to vulnerable populations. So I'm going to again expand the screen so this is all we see. So similar concept, some of the questions are in different order. So we're going to start off with initiation documentation of one of the following. So if you select any of the following, you can go to the next VS. So that's if you have initiation documentation of a fingerprint-based FBI check, compliance state of service or residence check, and a vendor in check that includes nationwide search of state or criminal history information. If you do have one of those, it's going to ask again, was it initiated before start of work, work or service? If yes, it's going to ask if accompaniment was required. If a company was required, it's going to ask if it was performed. I'm just going to go down the yes route right now. And if a company was performed, then it's going to ask you about the sex offender check. So it's going to be those same, uh, same different types of sex offender checks that NSOPW, incomplete NSOPW, FBI fingerprint check, um, state sex offender check from either state of service, residence, and then a vendor national service check. If you have all of those, and if it's adjudicated and also adjudicated on time, it's going to get to high mitigation. If you have a sex offender check, but it's not adjudicated or it's not adjudicated on time, it's going to take you to moderate mitigation. If you were un if accompaniment was required and not performed, you're still going to get that sex offender check question, but you're either going to end up in a low mitigation or moderate mitigation situation. It's going to be moderate if the sex offender check was adjudicated and adjudicated on time. Otherwise, it's going to be a low mitigation matrix. Then if we start again at the beginning, if you have initiation documentation for, again, FBI state of any of the state checks and then a vendor check, which includes a nationwide, state of cert, nationwide search of state criminal history check information. If you don't have any of that, the next question is going to be, again, do you have or if you don't have the initiation documentation, do you have the actual check present? If you have the actual check present, even if it's late, you're going to get that sex offender check again. If you don't have the actual documentation of the check, you're going to end up in low mitigation. But if not, you're going to get, again, answer whether the sex offender check has been adjudicated and adjudicated on time. If so, you're going to end up in moderate mitigation. If not, it's going to be low mitigation. So from these flowcharts, you really see how important that sex offender check is. Because again, what you have to think about in eligibility, it's going to be murder and offenses that require you to register on a sex offense registry. Oftentimes, murder is going to, is definitely going to show up on your FBI and state. All right, so we're going to minimize again. And then stop again here. Any, any questions on that? Go ahead and type it in. Oh, great. Thanks, Meredith. I'm glad you think the flowchart is great. I want to get this to you guys this month. It has been, <laughs> we created these in freaking March. <laughs> so. It'll be bigger. bigger. <laughs> yes. It'll be bigger. We're going to add most likely like a thesaurus type thing. Is this information incorporated into a spreadsheet anywhere? It was at one point. It was in the enforcement log, but we got a lot of complaints about how it was too unwieldy and no one liked to use it. So we're like, all right, we'll take it down. We are in the process of creating a much more beautiful form. It will not be a spreadsheet. And hopefully that can come out soon to you guys as well. Yep. So how do you self-report and how often should you self-report? We got some new questions coming in. All right. So how do you self-report and how often you, you should self-report? You, self you should self-report anytime you see any non-compliance because when you self-report, you're going to get a lower rate than if someone else found it and that someone else could be commission staff, it could be CNCS staff. How do you self-report? those? In, that information is in the enforcement guide. There are some, there's a lot of documentation that you have to provide. Um, and then when you self-report, you don't just send a check or the commission shouldn't just send a check to CNCS. You need to wait until you receive a debt notification letter from the corporation. 
what do I mean by adjudication? <clears throat> I mean, it needs to be documented that the results have been reviewed and the person is not a sex offender. Someone who is registered to be a sex offender are already registered on a sex offense registry and have not committed murder. So that needs to be documented somewhere. I've seen it on uh, the actual checks and I've also seen it on a form, on like a separate form that people use to like keep track of all the information. So again, if you have an NSOPW res result and there's, there are no results, you still have to adjudicate it. Still someone has to look at it and say, this person's okay, I'm good. Um, in terms of documentation, I've seen people do their signatures and a date and a reason why this person is not your candidate. Can I explain the dollar amounts? <clears throat> so the dollar amounts are two different dollar amounts. What the lower rate is this your self-reporting rate. Your higher amount is going to be the standard disallowance. So that's um, if someone has discovered it, if a monitoring official has discovered it. So that's usually CNCS program officers and could be commission staff. Should we prorate start date stipends based on complete NSCHC checks and enrollment? You know, I actually don't understand enough about how you guys do your start date that I don't know the answer to that. I don't, I don't fully understand that question, um, so I will just write it down. Yeah, Angela, I, this is Barbara. I would also recommend um, reaching out to your program officer specifically. He or she may know, have more detail about your program design and it may, may give you um, or be able to think that through with you in a, in a full way. Yeah. So we play, the next question is, so we pay CNCS for noncompliance? Yes, that's correct. You, CNCS will issue a debt notification letter. It will go to the prime grantee and um, that letter, I think, details like how you pay for it, if there's like a payment plan or something like that, um, and more details. And yes, that payment comes to CNCS. So I got a question from Teresa. Is that for fingerprints and NSOPW checks? Uh, do you mind clarifying that question? I don't think I understand what the what that is referring to. If the if the penalty, the dollar penalty applies to both, is that the that, disallowance? The disallowance. Yeah. Penalty. So when I say when I talk about criminal history checks or national service criminal history checks, I'm talking about uh, a host of things. It's going to be it's going to be your three the three checks that you have to do, which is going to be your NSOPW, could be two state checks, could be state of service, state of residence, and your FBI check, and then all of the documentation requirements that are that are that are needed and tied to criminal history checks. So that could be the uh, verifying identities with the photo with the government issued photo ID. It could be getting consent from the um, from the person to do the checks. It can be the understanding that. Um, becoming an AmeriCorps member or someone who's, or a staff member who's paid by CNCS dollars or match funds is, like, to become one of those is dependent on the results of the check. So it includes a whole host of things. So, so I guess shortly, yes, these fine, these, this allowance is associated with the criminal history checks, but it's also more than that, if that makes sense. Do you guys use any other background vendors for these host of things? So yes, there. In order to do, there is a vendor for your FBI checks. It's called Fieldprint. Fieldprint is a vendor that is approved by CNCS to provide grant uh, to provide you FBI checks. And we can, I think I, yeah, in a couple slides I have more information about it, so we'll get to that as well. And we are in the process of getting another vendor to get to do the state and NSOPW for you. Oh, we've got a lot of questions. 
during an audit, how many years back could we be audited on? If we were audited and self-disclosed in 2016, our auditor is only looking at files from 2016 to present. Alyssa, I do not know the answer to that question either. But if you self-disclose, you should definitely keep all that documentation in your files. Another question is, so CNCS issues a debt notification letter. Uh, so CNCS issues a debt notification letter to the prime recipient. Does the prime recipient pay directly to the CNCS, or is it the non-compliant subgrantee? It is actually kind of the choice of the prime recipient. CNCS only has a relationship with the prime recipient, so however the prime recipient decides to levy, how they decide to get that money to CNCS is up to them. So there's, there's no um, guidance that CNCS provides on how, how they do that. We just know that the, that the cost comes to CNCS from the prime recipient. Yep. And we it looks like we skipped the question. Oh, that's the question that we just answered. Okay, cool. All right, guys, we're going to keep going, and then we'll come back. Come back to the questions. All right, let's talk about mitigation matrix examples. So you guys, I forgot to make the, the answer of this a appearing <laughs> a transition. So you see already that this is a high mitigation. But we're going to go through this anyways. So let's say you're looking at your files. You see someone who has access. You're looking at a file where this person has access to vulnerable populations. You actually may want to write this down because we're going to go back to our flow chart to help you guys get a little bit more understanding about it. So basically, the start date is going to be 5-12-2018. FBI was initiated and adjudicated before the start date. The state was also initiated and adjudicated before the start date, but the NSOPW was missing. So what do we do? How do we get the mitigation rating from this? So we're going to go to recurring access to vulnerable populations. I'm going to make our screen big again. And let's look at this. So that first question is, is initiation documentation of the following present? We know we have it for the FBI and for the state. So yep, check off FBI, check out state. Let's go to yes. Go along the green yes column or yes arrow. And the next question is, was one of the above initiated before the start date? FBI was initiated on, hang on guys, I just, initiation was before, yeah, yep, sorry. So the FBI was initiated before the start date. So awesome. Let's go to, yes, was accompaniment performed? It wasn't required because you got, all the, you got state and FBI before. So you're going you're gonna to go to no. So is a sex offender check present? So what you can see then is an adjudicated FBI fingerprint check can count, and it was adjudicated before the start of service. So we'll say yes. And we know the FBI check was adjudicated because you went to field print and they gave you an adjudication and that was adjudicated on May 10th, so it's going to be a yes. And then was it conducted before the start of work service hours? FBI was adjudicated on 510, the start date was 512, so yes. It's going to result in a high mitigation. You're still going to get hit with a, with a disallowance because you are missing the NSOPW. All right, we're going to come back and go to the next slide. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Any questions on that quick example? That was actually a pretty easy one. All right, let's go to the next one here, which is a moderate mitigation example. This is someone who does not have access to vulnerable population. Start date was January 12th. And the FBI was initiated on the 12th and adjudicated on the 12th. And then NSOPW was done on, actually early, on the 11th, but it was not adjudicated. Why does this result in a moderate indication? Let's go back to that slide. Yeah. So no access to moderate, no access to vulnerable populations. They have the, let's see, is a sex offender check present? We know that there's a sex, a check, 
sex offender check present because we have an adjudicated FBI fingerprint check. And we can go to yes, was it adjudicated? Yes. And then was it adjudicated, was the sex offender check also initiated before start service work or hours? And unfortunately, no, because it's on that first day. It was on the 12th. So then it's going to go to no, is in the initiation document of one of the following checks present, even if late. We know the initiation documentation for the FBI is late, is on time. It's on, on, it is present, even if it's late. It's not late. It's on present. So then you're going to end up in a moderate mitigation setting. So it's going to be 500 or 1,000. Oh, I got a question. Is the NSOPW date correct? Oh, it's supposed to be 2018. My bad. So basically with that situation, I wanted to show you that the NSOPW, everything was done correctly, actually. FBI was initiated on time, even got adjudication day on time. NSOPW was run the day before, but the fact that it was not adjudicated it's going to result in a moderate mitigation rating. So that's why, again, it's so important to adjudicate. And, it, and again, let's step back from the, the forest, from the trees to look at the forest. Why is it important for it to be adjudicated? Because doing the checks is not enough. You have to look at it and make sure the person is eligible to serve. And I know it can be really easy to look um, at uh, NSOPW that has no hits you still have to document on there that you've looked at it, that this person is clear to serve. Yep, and I can pause here for some questions. So checks can be done same day as start date, not before. Yeah, checks can totally be done before. Yeah, they can just be done no later. So FBI and state checks can must be initiated no later than the start of service worker hours. NSOPW has to be done before. So in this case, NSOPW, the grantee did everything correctly. They did, they did the NSOPW before. They got the FBI initiated on the day of. They even got adjudication on the day of, but they did not adjudicate NSOPW. I think there are some questions coming, so I will, I will pause to wait for them. Sorry, just wondering why it's called disallowance and payment cannot come out of grant funds. Seems confusing. That is just the term that we call it and it's been cleared by our attorneys. Yeah. I see what I see what the comment means because allowable costs is something we talk about with grant funds, but we're talking about disallowance and it's it's actually not grant funds that are the penalty. Yeah, sure. That makes sense. We've got a question. So basically, we need some kind of document that, some kind of certification that we looked at results correct. Yeah, everything needs to be adjudicated. So that could be a, a separate form, um, or it could be just written directly on the checks. If we have a non-compliant check, is it best to notify you? No. Well, I mean, so. There's a lot in that question. If the person is ineligible, you must notify CNCS. If the person is non-compliant, you should self-report. Then you get the lower rate. I just see that we've got a couple more questions typing.
So I got a question about showing us an example of a compliant adjudication for NSOBW, FDI, and state check. I do not have one on me right now, um, but and we don't actually dictate what, what it should look like. So again, what I think the best thing to think about is, God forbid, pretend you're under an OIG audit. The OIG often um, uses contractors to do their audit. And oftentimes, these contractors may not have any idea about who you are, your organization, or your program even. So how can you prove to someone who is there to audit you, who has no relationship to you, or no understanding of your program, that you are compliant? They're going to be looking to the law, and they're going to make sure that you, they're going to be asking if you are compliant to the letter of the law. So you just need to document what you need to prove that you are compliant to the letter of the law. So I know that's probably not what everybody wants to hear, um, and a lot of people have turned to over-documentation, and I think that's fine. Remember, you're, whenever you have a government grant, if it's not documented, it's almost like it didn't happen. So I think you just have to be, you have to prove to any monitoring official and to an OIG auditor that you adjudicated these results. And how do you prove that if you don't document it? Yep, and this PowerPoint should be available afterwards. I believe in, in late July. Yeah, the, sli the slides actually were sent out via email earlier, uh -huh. um, but they'll, they will be up on the Knowledge Network as well, along with the, the audio recording. Yeah, and we'll update that in its OPW date. What is the best proof to use for initiation dates on FBI and state since many times there is, this is a fingerprint card in the mail? So this is actually up to you. So grantees have the ability to define what initiation means to them as long as one document is set beyond getting consent and it's on the path of getting a criminal history check. So that could be when you, um, maybe when you make the appointment for the fingerprinting, when you, maybe you make a copy of the fingerprint card or you have the form that someone fills out to get fingerprinted. So it's, it's up to you. You have the flexibility actually there to, to define it. But again, it should be defined in your policies and procedures. We've got a question from Leigh. We do have documentation for it, but we want to make sure it's compliant to CNCS standards, especially considering the new process. Just want to make sure. And do you mean by the new process, um, the enrollment, new enrollment form? Yes. Okay. I mean, I th I, I'm just going to go back to what I said earlier. I think it, what I've, it's, you need to document in order to prove that you've adjudicated this record. So I've seen a lot of times like a signature, a date, and the reason why this person is not, um, either that this person doesn't have any hits or that the person did not match any, that any of these records don't match your candidate. All right, we'll wait for one. I see Vivian is typing. We will wait for her question and we'll move on. And there'll be also time for Q&A at the end. I know method of documentation is left up to grantees, but can folks share how they have documented for out-of-state out of state checks and so they're often initiated by the member? Oh, is that a question that, a, that you were asking everyone else? Okay, cool. If people know and they want to share that, go ahead and feel free to answer that in the chat box. All right, we're going to move on. So this is our, no, our next example. This is going to be a low mitigation rate. This is someone who has access to vulnerable population. The start date is 12-11-2017. You can see this person has tried really hard, but they forgot about criminal history checks because everything was happening. Orientation was happening, members were coming on board. You guys are busy, totally understand that. So you can see the FBI was, FBI and states were initiated the one day after the start date. And they actually even got all their adjudication on that same start date, which is great. And then their NSOPW was also initiated late. It's 
was initiated one day late and it was missing Florida. So this is going to result in a low mitigation rating. And we're going to go back to that low chart so you guys can see. So that first question there is initiating documentation of the following present. So yeah, they had initiating documentation for FBI and state. So we're going to go to yes. And was one of the above initiated before the start, service, start of service worker hours? No. We're going to follow the red arrow across that asks for if any of the checks were present but late. And actually, yes, all of them were present. But then the next question is going to be about that sex offender check. Was it present? Yes. Was it adjudicated? Yes. But was it was the adjudicated sex offender check initiated before the start service worker hours? No. So that's why you're going to end up at low mitigation. All right, so those are my three mitigation matrix examples there. I uh, just kind of created them just to show you how those flowcharts work and a little bit, hope you get a little bit better understanding of how that mitigation matrix also works. Again, we'll try to get these charts out in July this month. Vendor checks are a huge place of noncompliance, but there can be compliant vendor checks. They just, they have to, vendors have to prove so much to be compliant. There is a whole checklist that you should go through and you should talk to your vendor if you use them about what they're, about what they're, do, if what they're doing is compliant. And one of the big sticking points with vendors is the fact that their data is time limited. And so if you're able to find a vendor where, the, where their data is not time limited, then you should get that in writing from them. This is just one of the many things that vendors have to do in order to be compliant. But again, if you're using field print through the CNCS contract, you're good for the FBI check. So here's another, some more information about vendor checks. If they only give you a pass or fail adjudication, it has to be on information that's not time, time based, and that is not time limited, and it has to be based on the NSOPW. Again, that state check has to be initiated no, like all the timing still applies. So that state check has to be initiated no later than the first day of start, first day of work or service, and that's FBI check has to be initiated no later than the first day. So everything still applies if you're using a vendor. Let's talk about accompaniment. I've mentioned this before, and if any of you guys are doing accompaniment, you know that it can be a really big deal. And again, you're doing accompaniment if you have not gotten the results back of an individual, so you don't actually know if they're a convicted murderer or a sex offender. If by any chance they are a convicted murderer or sex offender, even if you've done all the checks on time, even if you've been doing accompaniment, that person is ineligible and you have to repay all the costs. So if you are doing accompaniment, that is basically when they're in the physical presence of someone who meets the definition of a compliant accompanier. And then you can seize it as soon as you get the FBI checks or from or the state checks from both states if both are needed. And it must be documented. So let's talk about what a compliant accompanier is. It could be an employee or a representative of the site that's already allowed access to the to people and to vulnerable populations by their organization. So for example, a teacher already is cleared for access to work with children. Someone in a nursing home or any set, or someone who's at a like a medical facility has already been cleared to work with those individuals. It could be a parent or a guardian. And it could also be someone who is on the CNCS grant who's already cleared their requirements, their NSCHC requirements. Can it be another AmeriCorps member or a VISTA member? So it can be another AmeriCorps state and national member as long as they've cleared their background check. I would, the VISTA member is interesting. I haven't gotten that question because this is not, this is kind of bound by different rules. They have a different criminal history check procedure. And I don't want to give you a definitive because I know, yeah, so let me get back to you about that. That's a great question.
All right, and what is compliant accompaniment documentation? So it has to be documented contemporaneously, so as it happens. It needs to include the time, the date, and the name of the accompanying individual. individual. And you have to have policies and procedures that clearly describe this. So as you can tell, there's a lot that's included in accompaniment. Let's talk about ASPs and exemptions. AS alternative search procedures are a way for grantees to apply to do the checks in a different way. We get these pretty regularly. Right now you can email ASP requests at cns.gov. Um, there is a form to fill out. But you need to know if you have an ASP and you don't follow the ASP that, and you are non-compliant, that whole file is non-compliant. So if you are non-compliant, but you have an ASP, the monitoring official should still look at look at that compliance without regard to that ASP if you didn't follow it. So even if you have an ASP but you're not following it, then it does not apply. ASP is an alternative search procedure. And you can find more info on that on our Knowledge Network. Field print. So, field print is a channeler that's approved by CNCS to provide adjudicated FBI checks. So, let me just unpack that a little bit. What is a channeler? A channeler is a word that I've never seen ever before um, other than with the FBI, but I think it's a word the FBI created. It basically means that they have a channel into the FBI's database, and there are about, I think, 16 private organizations, private vendors right now who have access to the FBI database. 15 FBI channelers. Field print is one that we have contracted to provide grantees an adjudicated check. So that means that you, it's actually really great. You do it online. You, um, people can create appointments to get their fingerprints live scanned. And then what you get back in return is not going to be the rap sheet. It's going to be basically green light for cleared, red light for not cleared. If it's not cleared, um, that doesn't necessarily mean the person is ineligible. What that means is that there could be a, a, an arrest or some information that field print can't clearly adjudicate their information. So you can go back to the member or the staff person to say, if something came up on your FBI check, do you, do you have any documentation that proves you are not a convicted murderer or sex offender? And if that's the case, they can still serve. So, oh yeah, cool, go ahead. Uh, the checks are 2750. Turnaround time is 48 hours. We get reports from them this past month, I think, in in June. They did about 3,000 checks. 100% of them came back in 48 hours. I know they can do more than 3,000 checks. So if you are not using Fieldprint and you are facing a challenge in any way, use Fieldprint. It is a resource out there for you. And do we have any questions? I see Ted is doing some questioning, some answers here. So, yep, ASP stands for Alternative Search Procedure. If accompaniment was provided and documented, but not to the extent to ask for, would that be a cost disallowance? This is the hard part about accompaniment. Everything has to be documented. If you documented everything perfectly, let's say the person needs to be accompanied for a week. If you documented everything perfectly for six out of the seven days, you're still non-compliant. So if you look in the mitigation matrix, or in the enforcement guide, sorry, right above the mitigation matrix, you're going to have, you're going to see a little section about accompaniment. And basically there are some conditions that mitigate non-compliant accompaniment. So if accompaniment is performed and not documented sufficiently or contemporaneously, it can qualify as mitigated accompaniment. And if it's not documented sufficiently or contemporaneously, you have to prove that your program model shows that accompaniment is a standard process. So you can read more about that page six on the enforcement guide. So, oh, got some questions coming up here. Aaron says, if I'm not mistaken, one of the benefits of field print is that the results go back directly to the pr program, not the member. Is this correct? So I believe both people will see the results. Um, the member can see that they've been cleared and that the organization will also see that you've been cleared. Unless, has someone gotten a different experience in that?
And again, they're not going to get their whole rap sheet. They're just going to get basically green for yes, red for no. And we've got another question. If program has additional disqualification criteria above and beyond CNC's requirements, such as grant threats, will field print provide more information than the adjudicated results? So unfortunately, no. You will, field print is actually legally not able to give grantees the actual whole rap sheet. Um, they can only give that adjudication determination. So you can ask them for, you can look at your state check for more information or you can run a new check. Let's see, are the disallowances per member? Yes. So if you have five non-compliant members, it's going to be five times whatever the mitigation rate is. If you have a thousand non-compliant members, it's going to be a thousand times whatever the mitigation rate is. So I've got, in California, we use a local vendor for fingerprint live scan, which checks FBI. That can get, the can field print be used to get state of residence check. So I'm actually going to push back on you, Vivian, and ask, why don't you use field print to get your FBI checks? Why do you go to a local vendor? Um, and then field print, again, if you're, if you guys want to be using a vendor, uh, I don't know what field print state checks are like, but if you're going to use a vendor, I strongly, strongly, strongly suggest you to look at that vendor checklist on the Knowledge Network page. It goes through almost like 20 questions about what vendors need in order to be compliant. And I, I'm sad to, I hate to say it's bad news, but basically, if you are using a vendor who tells you they are compliant, but then you see checks from the vendor that are not compliant, you're not compliant, and you're still going to be responsible. So regardless if you do the checks personally or if you have a vendor do it, the disallowance is going to end up with the grantee. Let's talk about fear and fraud. I know we we just went through the mitigation matrix and we just talked about disallowances and we talked about the real financial consequences of not doing your criminal history checks correctly. And I know it can be very scary for grantees and it's had this really unfortunate um, unintended consequence of fraud. And I just want to reiterate that fraud is never worth it it's never worth it you would always always rather pay the disallowance than be investigated for fraud so and it happens it happens at least happens once a year for the past two years that i've known about it often happens with nsopw people are they run it late they're scared so they will um doctor the document and we can often always tell. Whenever there is an instance of fraud, we immediately report that to the OIG, the Office of Inspector General, and they will open an investigation. I have heard of instances where grants are lost, where money is paid back, where people have lost jobs, where people lose the program. So fraud is never, ever worth it. Sorry to be a downer right there. Let's, talk real, let's go back to the check, check box here. We've got a question from Vivian. When we do checks personally for states, some states have an online name-based search and a fingerprinting process. Do we need both or can we do the online name check? So again, you want to make sure you're going to the correct state repository. We have a list of the CNCS approved state repository on the Knowledge Network. And it does not matter to us whether it's a name or fingerprint uh, check. You just need to get one of those. All right. So let's step back again and talk a little bit about why we do this and why there are penalties associated with not doing it. And it's, it's really because of safety. You never want to be in a situation, CNCS never wants to be in a situation we, where we have exposed our communities to someone who has con been convicted of murder or registered or required to be registered on a sex offense, of a sex offense. It's just it's dangerous and not a good look. It's not something we should ever, it's not something we should ever be having to deal with, um, which is why, again, it's so important to create that culture where abuse is discussed because a lot of times these crimes can happen because, like, sex offenses can happen because a sex offender isn't caught yet. But if you create a culture where they know they are not welcome where, and people are trained to uh, report what they see, then hopefully you will not 
they will not apply to your program, you will not get them in your program. So again, when you're thinking about creating a safety program within your organization, just be thinking about your mission and your individual activities, what's appropriate for you guys, and how do you make sure that fits with your culture and the language of the beneficiary served by your organization. Think about your insurance requirements. Again, no need to reinvent the wheel. There are a ton of resources out there. And just think about state and national laws. You don't want to violate any of them um, by, yeah, you don't want to violate any of them. We've got another, do we have another question here? In California, our account is set up through the Department of Justice and all, all of our life scans have FBI included. Yep, I believe that's the appropriate state repository for California. All right, so what are some resources to support you? Um, I've talked about our Knowledge Network quite a bit. There's a link at the bottom of the page there. You can also go to our homepage, or I also, I just Google CNCS, CHC, or NSHC, it usually comes up. You're gonna get information there about the e-course that is required annually, FAQs, which is probably our most comprehensive document. You're gonna find resources on our states, on how to do the state checks, the FBI checks. The lovely enforcement guide is up there as well and the vendor guidance and other checklists. And of course, reach out to your program officer for any questions that you have. We've got a question. If our internal policies state that all background checks will be reviewed and checked, is this considered adjudicated or do we physically need to write on the results? I would still document that each result has been adjudicated on the check or on a different form. You have to show that you did it, yeah. not just that you intend to do it. Exactly. All right, guys, we've had excellent questions come through the chat throughout this presentation, but now let's just open it up. What do you got for me? Yeah, Meredith strongly suggests you sign the document, exclamation mark and smiley face. Agreed, agreed, <laughs> agreed. Wondering if adjudicating is accomplished with a determination form. I don't know what your determination form is or looks like, but as long as it shows that you've cleared someone and you've documented that, I think it should be okay. Again, you just have to document that you've adjudicated someone for service and cleared them for service. So Fieldfront is the only vendor that you can use. Fieldfront is the only vendor that CNCS has a contract with to do the FBI checks. CNCS is not aware of any other vendor who is 100% compliant in 100% of our um, requirements. We know that Fieldprint is completely um, compliant with the FBI requirement. Using vendors or you can use vendors, they are at your own risk and they are a huge point of non-compliance. So again, if you're gonna use a vendor, look at that vendor checklist and make sure that they can answer all of those questions to you in writing and that they abide to that. Do you, do you only use field print when the state doesn't provide FBA checks? You can use field print whenever you have, if you, you use, you can use field print if you come across any challenge in getting your FBI check. So that can mean it takes a really long time, it's really hard to adjudicate, it's way more expensive maybe, yeah. So any challenge you have getting your FBI check, you can use field print.
So sorry, guys, if, I've, if you haven't been able to hear me. Um, I am closer to the phone, so hopefully you can. A lot of school districts use field print, but the fee is a lot higher. But if you don't go through, through the specific district, they will not accept the fingerprint clearance. So you are allowed to accept clearances. It's one of the pre-approved ASPs, um, which is on the Knowledge Network. There are about six of them. So you can accept a clearance letter. You just have to have certain documentation with that letter. Oh, sorry, guys. Hope, hope this audio is OK. Can accompaniment be documented via notation on a time card? The time cards are a place that we see a lot of documentation for accompaniment. But again, you just got to make sure that you have everything that's required on it. So again, it needs to be done contemporaneously. I think the person, um, I think the best practice is if that person signs off on it, the accompanier signs off on it. Yeah. All right, so I hope you guys at Symposium, I will be there. We will have a different training. We're going to dive into some different topics. Hopefully have some good, exciting news for you. Uh, but other than that, thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. Great. Hey, this is Barbara again. Thank you, Liz. Uh, we are going to go ahead and wrap up for today's presentation. Um, thank you so much for all of the wonderful questions. I know I heard Liz say more than once. That is an interesting question. I will have to check it out. Um, so whenever you can stump the expert, I think that is, um, that is a good, good day on the webinar. So I want to uh, just ask you if you could take a minute, uh, and if you will, please take a minute to give us some feedback on today's presentation. As I said at the beginning, we, uh, we conduct these uh, on a regular basis, and we definitely want to improve to best meet your interests and your needs. So the link to the evaluation form for today's session is posted on the slide, and it's also in the web links box that you should see on your screen. So you should be able just to click right on that and go into the survey now. Um, so please take a second to do that if you would. As Liz said, the recording for today will be on the Knowledge Network in uh, probably about a week, so about seven calendar days. Please join us or have your staff join us in two weeks for the next uh, next program development or program staff training, it is going to be all money, all, all hour long, uh, looking at financial grants management um, and all of the, the great things to do to build a strong foundation. That's what we'll be doing in a couple weeks. I want to, again, thank you. Uh, thank Liz very much for your time and your expertise, and thank all of you guys for logging on. Um, we know there was a lot to talk about and think about today. We hope it's super useful. Um, again, thank you so much, and have a good rest of your day.